aside from love, few things attract more longing than the prospect of a holiday. During the ordinary working months, exhausted by our jobs and family routines, wearied by the weather and the drabness of our surroundings, our holidays stand out on the horizon of our frayed lives as oases of happiness and repose. And yet, the business of going on holiday is rarely examined from anything other than a bluntly practical point of view. We hear no end of talk of where we should go. What gets less attention is why. What gets us going on holiday in the first place? What are we searching for? How might our travels measure up to the longings that inspired them? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could live your dream of enchanted places bathed in magic? In the bitter London winter of 1776, William Hodges first exhibited the pictures he'd painted while accompanying the explorer, Captain Cook, on his voyage to Tahiti. The paintings were a promise of happiness. Of fresh horizons, warmed by the sun. Some 230 years later, the imagery has barely changed. Come closer now. Look. You can almost touch it. And neither have the promises. Where in the world can you feel so free, so in love with life's pleasures? I thought of going on a Mediterranean cruise. So in tune with its treasures. It seemed to offer everything I was looking for. Discover how special you can feel. Sunshine, the excitement of being on a glamorous ship, some destinations I'd always wanted to see, and perhaps a chance to make some new friends. Queen Elizabeth II lived the dream. I decided I'd try to find happiness there. The QE2 was even more beautiful than I'd imagined. There were chocolates on the pillow at night. There were artfully moulded toiletries in the bathroom. The ship was repainted every morning and was resplendent in the Mediterranean sun. We sailed that evening for Barcelona, a city I'd always dreamt of visiting. Almost a thousand staff, predominantly Filipino, worked flat out to anticipate just over a thousand passengers' whims. They cooked 4,000 eggs each day and carved elephants out of cocoa butter. Do you think people appreciate it? They love it. Yeah. They're always asking, oh, wow, who's who made this? this? Yeah. Right, so you must feel proud. Yeah, <laughs> feel happy. You feel happy? Yeah. Great. Someone asked for haggis off the coast of Sicily and got it. There was a ping-pong table, a synagogue, a nail salon, and a morgue. I even met a passenger who liked the ship so much, she'd been living there for the past five years and planned to stay on board till she died. Do you mind not having a window in, in, no, in the room? No, it does, this is my window. This is the view from the bridge. It's almost better than a window. The captain and his senior officers, all British, looked fabulous in a Noel Coward kind of way. Everything was exactly as the brochure had promised. But there was one thing that wasn't as I'd hoped, though this wasn't something I could complain to anyone about. By the middle of day one, a troubling realization began to dawn on me. 
that I'd inadvertently brought myself along with me on my holiday. Having nothing to do all day can be an exceptionally alarming proposition. All those larger, deeper thoughts that we have about ourselves, but that we manage to push to the back of our minds during the course of our ordinary lives, have a habit of breaking through to consciousness with a vengeful force during our leisure times. It seems that our suitcases are not the only baggage we're fated to bring along with us. Looking back at the brochure that I'd read at home, I realise that if pictures of holiday destinations are generally so attractive, it's chiefly because we forget that we're going to have to be in them. For example, it's not going to be this athletic gentleman playing golf, being admired by a beaming companion on deck. It will be you. And it won't be this trio of charming guests having lunch in the Lido restaurant. You will be. And come evening, it won't be this silver fox ordering a bottle of vintage champagne for his companion. It'll be you. Wherever we choose to go, perhaps the underlying wish is simply for me to get away from me. It's a desire long recognized by Eastern schools of meditation, which argue that the greatest holiday of all is one where we can float free from the tyranny of being conscious one where we don't have to come along. I'd been desperate to visit Barcelona for over 15 years. I imagined a heady mix of stunning architecture, political liberalism and attractive people. I dreamt of impassioned debates in cafes on the Ramblas and of befriending a beautiful architecture student on the steps of the Mies van der Rohe pavilion. From my cabin, I could, by craning my neck, just glimpse some of the buildings I'd long to see. But as I watched my fellow passengers lining up for the city tours, I suddenly changed my mind. I decided to stay on board the QE2. My decision not to get off the ship was sparked by reading one of the odder novels of French 19th century fiction, a book called Against Nature by the writer Rismars. Now, the hero of this book is a character called Desissant, and he's terrifically eccentric and effete. He lives in a large villa just outside Paris and rarely leaves this villa because he finds most of humanity ugly and depraved. I'm going to introduce you our driver. His name is Jesus. But one day he decides that he would like to go on a journey. He decides that he wants to travel to London. In all Barcelona, be careful with pickpockets. So he sits on long winter evenings and imagines how lovely it would be to be in London. He looks at the Baerdecker's Guide, he reads about the museums, the parks, the shopping arcades, and he has a lovely time. Finally, the day comes when he has to leave to go to London. He suddenly thinks, I'd be a complete fool actually to go to London. And, uh, well, uh, there is uh, this traffic jam. He thinks there would be crowds, there would be noise, there would be the food that might be bad. It's forbidden to eat ice creams. All the inconveniences of travel flood his mind and he thinks, I'd be a fool to go. Instead, what he does is he dedicates a room inside his villa to what he calls imaginary travel. He's got various objects in this room that will help to evoke for him the best sides of travel without any of the downsides. He gets a large sail, which he occasionally flaps around to evoke the sound of uh, a sailing ship. He gets a large jar of seawater, which occasionally undoes the lid off to smell uh, the lovely evocative smells of the sea. He died in 1926. It's a mad idea, obviously, and yet, nevertheless, it captures quite acutely, I think, uh, one of the paradoxes of travel, and that is that it's sometimes when we're sitting at home before we actually travel, looking through the brochure, that we enjoy travel in its purest and perhaps even best form. Maybe one of the most naive things we can do to a place we dream of is actually to go there. Day three. 
This chip is an extraordinary machine for pleasure. Every desire that you might have can be fulfilled here. And yet, well, really the feeling is, what am I doing here? Is this fun? Am I having a good time? And if not, what's wrong with me? It's, it's, it's odd. We're all sitting here in our little cells, little cells for pleasure, doing time. I'm not quite sure what crime we've committed, and yet we are doing a kind of time. Holiday time. The ship stopped at Malaga next. I decided to kill the time in Torremolinos. As I'd never wanted to go there, I imagined I wouldn't be disappointed. We go to great lengths to have fun on holiday. We dredge bays and despoil whole coastlines and invent motorized contraptions for pleasure. And yet all this vast construction and destruction rests on an assumption which goes largely unexamined. The idea that just by moving from point A to point B will automatically be happier. The French philosopher Pascal said, the sole cause of man's unhappiness is that he doesn't know how to stay quietly in his room. we tend to travel with a material understanding of happiness. That is, that the better the surroundings, the weather, the food, the linen, the happier we will be. But happiness is an unpredictable creature that may not show up when it should. There was a ball on the ship that evening. Hello. Hello. For passengers Lillian and Sheila, it was the high point of the cruise. Number one. Number one. Yeah. And that is... Oh, that's the one in the picture. picture. That's that, yes, that one. <laughs> that's fantastic. Best dressed lady on the ship. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. But... Had you been on a cruise before? I had with my husband, so when he died, of course, uh, I didn't go anymore. So then so you when... said... You've when we up. met up, we thought, well, we'd travel together. Then we wouldn't be quite so lonely. So when you sail away, do you ever think there might be romance on the ship? There's always a hope Not that really. you might meet someone. Oh, there is. You just think you might meet someone. But um, I have met in the past, but life on board ship is far different and when you get ashore it's not quite the same so it's, it's the holiday romance and then it you, is, you come back and to it's room. not the same so who's that that's that's your husband no yeah, no no it's it. roger hmm? how come you chose to be photographed with roger how did that come up i didn't ask him he asked me <laughs> so maybe maybe he's got a soft spot for you he's he's single yeah mm, yeah it's very nice company mm. So, Roger, tell me what you do on board the ship. Well, on board the ship, uh, I am a gentleman host, and my main function is to dance with the ladies. What happens if you're dancing, you're, you're with a, a, a lady, and you feel that she's perhaps fonder of you than the rules might allow? Oh, How do you, you, what, you, you cannot training get, in those sort of situations? No, you just cannot get involved. The rule is, you know... Don't, don't get amorous. You can't, you cannot get close to any woman on board. Has any woman ever actually become amorous? Oh, yes. They, they want to go for a drink with you or whatever, and you can't do that. It's a no-no, and we know that. So we watch that very close. But sometimes the ladies might not know that. We tell them. Yeah. So you say, I really like you, but 
you know, I don't want to have to pay my... I don't even tell them I like to. I like the way you dance. I like to continue dancing with you. But hey, nothing more than that. We misunderstand what holds up our moods. We're sad at home and blame the weather and the drabness of our surroundings, forgetting that, even in idyllic settings, we're prone to collide with emotional icebergs. Disappointment on holiday reminds us that the key ingredients of happiness are never material or aesthetic, but always stubbornly psychological. I mean, so much of cruising is the idea of getting away from yourself, sailing away into some blissful blue future. And I guess in the night time, your real self has a habit of... Indeed, the phone call will actually come through to the office at three in the morning, and, and they just want to talk. Some people take stock of their life. It could well be that they come away on a cruise to save something that probably is not going to be saved and this is the catalyst and it's make your mind up time. But they'll be back, they'll be back next year. Wherever we choose to go, we're apt to come up against the inevitable gap between our dreams and the reality. But once we accept that, we're on the road to recovery. With that insight in mind, I set off on my next holiday, a weekend city break to Amsterdam. Have you ever stood in a beautiful piazza, in front of a landmark building in a European city, on a weekend city break, and wondered, with mounting anxiety, what am I doing here? What am I supposed to feel? Or perhaps you've got back to your hotel and slumped onto the bed, filled with listlessness and self-disgust, unable to face another must-see attraction. The guidebook has given you a bad case of culture guilt. One of the things that we're supposed to have in bucket loads when we travel is curiosity. Open the average guidebook to the average city and you'll find a whole menu of things that you're supposed to be very keen to go and see. A town hall, ten churches or so, five men on horseback, some museums and shopping arcades. And yet, oppressed by this degree of choice, we may wonder what, if anything, we're genuinely curious about. Do you think we're completely lost? No, I think we're fine. We've come along the 202 from Amsterdam and we're now at Ichmuden. I'm in the car with Bryony Hellis, somewhere in the windswept flatlands of the eastern Netherlands. Bryony's husband John was on the hunt for World War II bunkers. These tend not to feature in guidebooks. Is he good with his binoculars? Yeah, he's very good with his binoculars, and he's looking a bit excited up there. Oh, so really? I think he must have found oh, that's something. Right. Yes. yes, he's jumping, yes, up, he's and jumping down. up and down. I definitely know. I definitely know. They were here. Ah, there's one. Ah, where? Where? Straight there. ahead. Oh, goodness. How can you tell immediately? The eye knows. So, ah. Oh, goodness. Oh, my me. goodness gracious. It's huge. There's yet another one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, my goodness gracious me. And another. And one in the dunes there. I think we have to stop here. Yes. Not in the middle of the road. But it's huge. It's oh, like an yes. Egyptian burial chamber. Oh, yes. Look at that. Is that Nazi graffiti, or is that...? No. no. So you never get bored on holiday, do you? No. No. Because not only do you look at the concrete, but how many people would drive through an industrial estate, as we did today, and how many people see that side of the holiday? 
Guidebooks distort the psychology of our curiosity. They present a vision of the world where everything is already known, already measured and appraised. Their judgments are not necessarily false, but their effect can be pernicious. It's as if, after each authoritative entry, they'd added, and there's something weird about anyone who doesn't agree. How do people develop passions? I think there's a certain level of nosiness, inquisitiveness. Mm. You just asking questions all the time and so why you know, why are these here because it opens your eyes up to other things as yeah, well exactly that that's the point uh, the the bunkers were where it started but we've learned to look around we're no longer focused at ground level and yet then you get these listless large groups of tourists just wandering mm. around not knowing what to yawning. look at yawning mm. and they're all looking at the guide. And what is the guide going to tell me next? Um, and no one is looking around. And no one is saying, excuse me, um, what's that building? Because that, their life is, is focused on the guidebook. We should learn to nourish the shoots of our own wayward curiosity. And we should learn to treat with care that most prescriptive most enthusiasm-destroying of travel implements, the guidebook. I've not seen a hole like that in any of the French bunkers. One of the things we tend to look for when we travel is somewhere exotic. The word first came into widespread use in the 19th century, and it was used to refer to places like Egypt, Syria and Lebanon. It was about markets and harems, about men with small moustaches, camels, mint tea and dunes. Though there tend to be some pretty stock associations around the word exotic, in fact, you could find almost anything exotic, depending on where you come from and what your tastes are. I remember this came home to me one day when I was flying back to London from a holiday I'd had in Egypt. And I was sitting next to an Egyptian man and chatting to him on the flight. And as we were coming into land at Heathrow, we looked out the window and it was a typical English summer's day, very dark grey skies and sombre green fields. And I apologised to my companion and said, you know, I'm really sorry about the conditions on the ground. And he said, no, 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 this is all incredibly exotic to me. And I thought, well, of course it is. If you come from a land of uh, sand and pyramids, a typical English summer's day is liable to be extremely uh, exotic. And I think that takes us right to the heart of a central issue in travel. You can learn a lot about a person by asking them, what's the country that you find exotic? For me, Holland is one of the most exotic countries in the world. But it's not in the red light district of Amsterdam that the true exoticism of Holland is to be found. It's in the more mundane details of everyday life, which were first and most famously celebrated by Dutch 17th century artists like Vermeer. There's something particularly alluring, I think, about Vermeer's women. Unlike many women in Western art, they're clearly grounded in reality. There's nothing ethereal or idealized about them. They go about their tasks with a sort of almost blunt directness. Uh, we see them pouring milk, sweeping the yard, uh, reading letters. And yet for all that, there is something very mysterious, almost sexual and private about them. One wants to get to know them rather better. I found the spirit of Vermeer's women alive and well in Ruth and Tinker, two Dutch girls that I met in the gift shop of the Rijksmuseum. You see, what I find amazing about the architecture is when you think that these houses, they're incredibly simple, I mean, they're almost modern. 
you know, all they are is very simple black bricks, window yeah. frames, no decoration at all. Yeah. And that's nice. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to have this kind of straightness. You know, the buildings, it's like the buildings are honest. The buildings yeah. are not decorated, and nor are the women. And so you, you think that reflects the people? Yes, and I think it shapes the people. I decided to move to Amsterdam. What would I need to do to fit in? You shouldn't wait for people to ask for your opinion. You should just give it straight ahead. Okay. About anything. Uh huh. Because if it, that that's the way it works over here. If you. So it should be more straight talking. Yeah. Definitely. You'd have to buy a bike. You'd have I, to I buy, course, a bike. buy a bike. Learn to ride it a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to live here in the Grachtengordel... In the who? In the Grachtengordel, <laughs> you shouldn't. Grachtengordel? <laughs> so poetic. You, don't, you can't even begin to appreciate the no. feeling of the longing that this, these beautiful sounds you make inspire. No, I hate the Dutch language. I hate the sounds no. as well, yes. Every country and every person could be said to lack certain qualities. All national stereotypes are unbalanced in some way so that one of the things we seek when we fall in love with countries is to rebalance ourselves. See, what I find exotic about these houses, they're, they're not nostalgic. A lot of yeah. British architecture is always about the past. Mm -hmm. And these seem to be accepting the modern world. You know, you can see right into people's houses. Yeah, just like here. Yeah, yeah. So if, if this was in England, this house would have a column, a fake column, a fake they, piece of wood. They wouldn't have the tables outside. They would definitely not have the tables outside. But once you move here, it wouldn't be exotic anymore. Uh, or... I don't know. I mean, that's that's a sort of tragic view. It's like saying, if you if you married the person you loved, yeah. you would no longer love them. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, what we find exotic abroad may be what we hunger for in vain at home. Actually, I think England is kind of exotic in a way. Too. Really? Why? Yes. What I find exotic is the, the politeness, the, the modesty, the, a bit, they're a bit shy. Shy? Yeah, they're yeah. not so direct. And there's this, this Hugh Grant kind of thing. Hugh Grant thing? <laughs> what, tell, tell me about the Hugh Grant thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I, I think I'm not the only Dutch no. woman who, who really, thinks is there, that. Is there a big Hugh Grant yeah, fan club yeah. here? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because he... he stands for everything I just mentioned in the, our eyes. I mean, and, the, and the Dutch men don't have? No, we, no. we definitely don't. Oh. We should follow our stranger interests and enthusiasms on holiday. They're telling us something important about who we are. I've always had a fascination for the business of just being on the road without any particular destination in mind. So I decided to go on a driving holiday around East Germany. Few places on earth are quite as poetic as airports. We normally think of getting to our destination as the boring, frustrating bit of our holidays. All the talk is of delays and queues, and we just want to get to where we're going. But there's a particular charm to the whole business of being on the way somewhere, and to the places we pass through in the process. I'd booked a fly-drive holiday to the former East Germany. Airports, roadside diners, train stations and motels may not be attractive in any formal, architectural sense, but I've always found them strangely beautiful and welcoming nevertheless. One of the most haunting places we're liable to encounter on our travels is perhaps the late-night motorway service station. These are weird places, quite lonely places, but I always find that there's a pleasant, almost redemptive kind of loneliness that you come across here. Because rather than feeling lonely in a place where everyone seems to have a friend, where the atmosphere is generally bustling and cheerful, any loneliness that you do happen to feel, if you bring it here, 
seems to be almost redeemed because here no one seems to have any friends. Everyone's rather lonely watching late night TV, nursing a drink. And I think there's something rather nice about drowning your sorrows in a generally rather sad environment. You feel that you're not the only one to be on your own and uh, any longing for love, any longing for companionship, even though it's frustrated here, is nevertheless acknowledged. The artist who first made me think about all of this was Edward Hopper. No one has captured the poetry of travelling places quite like Hopper. His figures look as though they're far from home. They're in search of work, sex or company, adrift in transient places. And yet they seem to hint that there might be something consoling, glamorous, sexy even, in travelling alone, far from home, on the road to nowhere in particular. A woman sits alone in a diner on a dark North American night. She unwittingly invites viewers to imagine stories for her, stories involving betrayal or loss. Automat is a picture of sadness, but it's not in itself a sad picture. It has the great melancholic quality of a piece of music by Bach or Leonard Cohen. Hopper puts us on the side of the outsider against the insider. He makes us feel that we're not alone in being alone. This is a perspective that travel at its best can offer us. It can be liberating to be a stranger among strangers. <laughs> Hotels offer a particular opportunity to experience anonymity and to speculate about the anonymous others all around us. No wonder Hopper painted them repeatedly. Being in a hotel room, the whole building almost silent except for the occasional swooshing of an elevator somewhere far down a corridor, puts us into a dreamy, almost trance-like state. We can take stock of our lives in a way it's hard to in the ordinary press of the working week. And we're helped in this by the unfamiliar surroundings. But outside the window, a mysterious city full of strangers stirring silently below us. There's a crackle of sexual energy in hotels. Hello. 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 Follow me, please. Hello again. Hello. 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 Evening. Olli Albrecht found hotels such sexy places, he built one himself in the suburbs of Dresden. So close the door, please. He called it the Hollywood Swingers Hotel. We uh, say uh, from swinger for swingers. Mm -hmm. This is the ideology from us. What about these gherkins? Gurkel. This, this uh, gurken is, is an, uh, a guest from us. This is a couple, oh. she makes this self. This is a couple, guests from us, make this in your film. And they brought their gherkins here. Something about being away from our ordinary habitat sets us free to release bits of ourselves that don't get an airing in everyday life. This is room number four. This is a double double room. A du I've never seen a double double yes. room. Yes. That's fantastic. Can I just check the. Yes, Ooh. sure, please. Very good. It's okay. Yeah, very nice. And then it really. It's great to have so it's, much it's, space. Yeah. It? <laughs> yeah. It's all new. Right. It's not necessarily at home that we best encounter our true selves. That is Yakuti. Ah. How I many mean, people can. Six people is very much fun. 
when you want eight people is okay, but I think it's not More much than fun. Eight. <laughs> it's, no, too it's too much, not, I think so. Yeah, it's too much. <laughs> Touchdown! At home, the furniture insists that we cannot change because it doesn't. My goodness. The domestic setting keeps us tethered to the person we are in ordinary life, but who may not be who we essentially are. You put your arms in here? Yes, you, when you want. You and can, then what, the, what will happen? Many people inside and ah. many people outside. But why these holes? You can, this is, this is for playing when you want. Right. When you want, you can ah. touch. But I suppose some guests you, you more want to touch than see. Yeah, sure. yeah. This Have is my fantasy. This, yeah. I've never seen this in anywhere, really. Follow me, please. It's very interesting. So this is the main so. reception area. Hello. Mm. Hello. So people come here just to chat? Yeah, and... so just for fun. Holly, what, what was the dream for you? Why did you want to start a hotel? The ideology. For ideological reasons. My wife and I, we are, we are swingers. And around the world, clubs are not so good. But the I, ideology is not, not the ideology. Ideology? Ideology from us. Uh -huh. but, and, but, but, and we, we have say, my wife and I, we have say, we make that better. It's better than ordinary hotels. I think it's, it's better. Almost, so. It's almost like it's the logical conclusion. Yeah. Almost, it's, it's the natural fulfillment of the idea yeah. of the hotel, yeah. 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 Hollywood. I was starting to enjoy my holiday to East Germany. I like driving down the new motorways which have snaked across the country since reunification. I've always liked motorways. Road journeys can be the midwives of interesting thoughts. But I only started thinking of them as objects of beauty when I came across the photographs of Hans Christian Schink. His work struck me as very German gloomy, but where the melancholy is mixed with an awe at the sheer superhuman scale of the engineering involved. Perhaps we don't stop to find many things beautiful on our journeys, because no one has yet drawn our attention to what to look out for. Schink's photographs remind me of a long German tradition. On my last morning in Germany, I went to look at Caspar David Friedrich's paintings in the Dresden Gallery. In the early 19th century, it was German artists in particular who turned their attention to painting bits of the world that hadn't really attracted the attention of artists before. High mountains, great deserts, vast silent forests. And what was thought to unite all of these different subjects was their capacity to arouse in us a feeling of what was called the sublime. Now, at the heart of this feeling of the sublime is the idea of being very small and powerless in front of something very large and powerful. A further claim was made at this point that this sense of being powerless was actually a very important one that we should try and get in touch with regularly. It was all about restoring perspective all about trying to find out where we stand in the world and what matters and what may not. This ability to see our own lives from such a radically different perspective is one of the greatest gifts travel can give us. It's the feeling we get when our plane surges above the clouds. For once, we can see our problems and preoccupations as they must appear to the hawks or the gods. Looking down at the earth from above can make us feel small in a rather good way. Normally, feeling small is a bit of a humiliating experience. Let's say uh, you're treated roughly in an office context or, or in the lobby of a smart hotel. But come up here, look down at the earth from here, look down at the tiny houses and cars. We realize that we're all subject to huge necessities, to vast forces far greater than we are, that we're all basically just specks of dust. And that's rather a nice feeling to have sometimes. But however pleasant it can be to be on the road, we will eventually have to come back. How can we feel less sad about having to return home?
it can be depressing to come home from a holiday. Suddenly, it's as if we've never been away. Home is routine, boredom, misery, and meetings. Whereas abroad was fun, sexy, confident, and bright. Which is actually rather strange when you think about it. Imagine the average aeroplane descending towards the average city. Let's say that half the people on board are returning home. They're sad, depressed, it's the end of the holidays, back to gloomy old home. But the other half, the other set of passengers, are going to somewhere new. They've never been there, they're incredibly excited, looking forward to discovering it. And yet the paradox is that these two sets of passengers are going to exactly the same place. And that points us to something rather important about travel, that maybe what makes a good traveller, what makes a fulfilled traveller, has less to do with the particular destination that you're going to and much more to do with your attitude towards it, much more to do with the way that you're looking at what you've come to see. Mm. I took a coach tour with a group of Japanese visitors to Britain. One of the reasons we travel is to see beautiful things. But one of the reasons coming home can be sad is the realization that beauty is fugitive. It's frequently found in places to which we may never return and which will gradually fade from our memory. How then to hold on to it? The standard solution is to take photographs. Exotic horse. What, what do you find exotic about the English so, building and uh, such as environmental protection system? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're taking many pictures for memories? Many pictures <laughs> and a video also. And a video. <laughs> That's just coming here today, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. There's the bus that was in front of us. Special name. This is lovely. There we are. That's lovely. English breakfast. English breakfast? Very powerful. Well, oh, really? One of the people who thought most deeply about what fixes beauty in our minds was the English 19th century critic John Ruskin. Writing at just the time when mass tourism was getting underway, Ruskin deplored the blindness and haste of modern travellers. He felt that they looked at things but didn't really notice them. I would like to tell you today about a philosopher called John Ruskin, an English philosopher. John Ruskin, the Yukatano. He asks us to give the camera, put it away, and start to draw, because if you draw, you see things, you see the beauty of things properly. Camera, I'm going to do Yep, that's great. Can you give me your video? I'll look after it, don't worry. That's fine. And what I'd like you to draw for me is the spire of this church. <laughs> Ruskin stressed that the point of sketching had nothing to do with drawing well nor with becoming an artist. It was about training ourselves to notice rather than to look. Only that way could we retain durable memories of the beautiful things we see. Modern tourism may have made it easier for us to reach beauty and to record it but it hasn't simplified the process of possessing it. Great disciples of Ruskin. <laughs> <laughs> but
but there's a deeper reason for the gloom that can descend on arriving back home than the fear that we might forget the things we've seen. It's because home seems so familiar and therefore boring. We shut all the bedroom windows. We forget that there might be another way of looking at where we come from, the way a traveller might. David and Hilary Holmes always holiday within a 20-mile radius of where they live. Having the caravan works out that we could have at least 17 holidays in a year. It's always local. Costs £6.25. Pence. If we actually forget something, we don't go far, so it's a 15-minute drive back home just to pick it up. One of the first people to challenge our negative assumptions about home was an eccentric 18th century Frenchman called Xavier de Mestre. De Mestre was enraged by the way people ignored their own countries and always venerated abroad. So he wrote a whole book in which he suggested that we stay at home and go on holiday around our own locales. His book was called a journey around my bedroom. You even got, got miniature wine? Yes. <laughs> Anything that fits in the cupboard. Yeah. Demestra's book is a minute account of a tour around his bedroom, observing this apparently familiar place with the curiosity of a traveller. It is a mini home mini on wheels. Home. Yeah. You're not saying that you're unadventurous. No. You're saying you're as adventurous no. as the people who fly off, right? Yes, yes, I am. But I want to do it closer to home. And do uh, you... There does seem to be uh, a, a lot of things people think where the grass is greener on the other side, that you've got to go abroad to have sun, you've got to go abroad to see exotic mm -hmm. things. But there again, they haven't actually explored the, their own countryside yet. And we found there's loads to do here. and. We don't really need to go abroad. You could almost stay yeah. just in Kent. You could. There are it, lots yeah. and lots of things yeah. that are on your own doorstep. Perhaps it doesn't really matter where we choose to go in the end. Great home. The pleasure we derive from journeys will always depend more on the outlook with which we travel than the places we travel to. There's such a thing as a traveller's attitude, an attitude of curiosity and receptivity to whatever catches our imagination. Armed with such an attitude, we might find the most unpromising sounding of destinations, or even our own backyards, becoming no less interesting than the butterfly-filled jungles of South America. We might learn to become travellers around our everyday lives. Promises. Where in the world can you feel so free, so in love with life's pleasures? I thought of going on a Mediterranean cruise. So in tune with its treasures. It seemed to offer everything I was looking for. Discover how special you can feel. Sunshine, the excitement of being on a glamorous ship, some destinations I'd always wanted to see, and perhaps a chance to make some new friends. Queen Elizabeth II. Live the dream. I decided I'd try to find happiness there. The QE2 was even more beautiful than I'd imagined. There were chocolates. Aside from love, 
few things attract more longing than the prospect of a holiday. During the ordinary working months, exhausted by our jobs and family routines, wearied by the weather and the drabness of our surroundings, our holidays stand out on the horizon of our frayed lives as oases of happiness and repose. And yet, the business of going on holiday is rarely examined from anything other than a bluntly practical point of view. We hear no end of talk of where we should go. What gets less attention is why, on a pillow at night, there were artfully moulded toiletries in the bathroom. The ship was repainted every morning and was resplendent in the Mediterranean sun. We sailed that evening for Barcelona, a city I'd always dreamt of visiting. Almost a thousand staff, predominantly Filipino, worked flat out to anticipate just over a thousand passengers' whims. They cooked 4,000 eggs each day and carved elephants out of cocoa butter. Do you think people appreciate it? They love it. Yeah. They're always asking, oh, wow, who's who made this? this? Yeah. Right, so you must feel proud. Yeah, <laughs> feel happy. You feel happy? Yeah. Great. Someone asked for haggis off the coast of Sicily and got it. There was a ping pong table, a synagogue, a nail salon, and a morgue. I even met a passenger who liked the ship so much. She'd been living there for the past five years and planned to stay on board till she died. Do you mind not having a window in, in, no, in the room? It no, does, this is my window. This is the view from the bridge. It's almost better than a window. The captain and his senior officers, all British, looked fabulous in a Noel Coward kind of way. Everything was exactly as the brochure had promised. But there was one thing that wasn't as I'd hoped, though this wasn't something I could complain to anyone about. By the middle of day one, a troubling realization began to dawn on me, that I'd inadvertently brought myself along with me on my holiday. Having nothing to do all day can be an exceptionally alarming proposition, all those larger, deep... What gets us going on holiday in the first place? What are we searching for? How might our travels measure up to the longings that inspired them? In the bitter London winter of 1776, William Hodges first exhibited the pictures he'd painted while accompanying the explorer Captain Cook on his voyage to Tahiti. The paintings were a promise of happiness. But fresh horizons warmed by the sun. Some 230 years later, the imagery has barely changed.